It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Over the weekend, Donald Trump claims brought in 50 million dollars uh double double did double what joe biden did and i gotta tell you i don't i don't buy it I, i'm sorry just just not buying it and this is the word that we're in we're in the, a world where i can't believe anything that comes out of the trump camp can't believe anything that comes out of uh, the republican party and and that's by design they don't want you to know what facts are they don't want you to believe they want us constantly at each other and and look i don't care whether they raise 50 million or not don't really care it'll it'll come out in whatever uh campaign ads and whatever they do but i find it interesting that our media man do they fall all over it Uh, because that was the big headline all on sunday about this big haul um not buying it And and i'm not buying it this is where, where Trump is the master, and you got to give him credit. He is the master at getting attention. He is the master at manipulating our media structure to, to basically, well, kiss his orange, you know. Uh, now, what I find interesting is still trying to play he's Mr. Art of the deal. Uh, over the weekend, I I had someone tell me, well, you know, Donald Trump's got a plan for abortion. You're gonna be you're gonna be sorry because I said, look, I think Republicans have a problem on the abortion issue. I think a lot of women are are kind of upset uh, that you're taking their rights away, rightly so. And this person said, no, no, Donald's got a plan. And I go, oh, and and this person then began to explain that Donald has a plan. It's a deal, and and the deal is going to make everyone happy. Uh, he's going to, uh, how did they put it? How did he put it? He's going to bring everybody together. He's going to unite everyone. They're going to, all the groups, everyone, kumbaya. You're going to get the, uh, the, the Planned Parenthood folks to sit down with the evangelical Christian uh, folks. You, no, no, you're not. Uh, but you know, this person really believed this. And he said, they're going to, they're going to make both sides happy. <laughs> like that's possible. Um, and, and he, this person told me that, you know, for the first time in 52 years, there's going to be peace on this issue. And I'm going, how can there be peace on the issue when you have people who are on the right saying absolutely no way in a cold day in the place that we hope not to end up in, am I going to stand for this? Um, the people who want to do away with contraception, the people who want to punish women for, for engaging in certain activities, how are you going to get them on board? And you're not, and you never are. And this is another one of those things that Trump does and does masterfully to get the media to go, well, well Donald's got a plan. Remember when Donald had a plan uh, to, uh, to have six weeks of paid maternity leave for any mother with a newborn child whose employer doesn't cover it? Remember that? Do we have six weeks of paid maternal leave? Oh, no, we don't. Remember when we we were going to get a health care plan that was going to be amazing? It was going to be beautiful. Um, Remember when he was going to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act? What what happened? Oh, yeah. Uh, Millions of Americans actually lost their health care because he didn't have a plan. And, well, they couldn't repeal it. And they offered nothing to replace it. Uh, remember when he said that he was going to be the, what was it, the, the voice of the American worker while his administration stripped workers' rights away, repealed overtime, rolled back workplace safety, um, you know, appointed someone to the wage and hour division, you know, the people who investigate wage theft, who themselves had been accused of wage theft. Remember when he said he was going to eliminate the federal deficit and, and 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 take on the debt only to make it go much higher? In fact, increase the federal deficit by more than 60%. Remember that? Remember when he was going to promise all American workers, you know, during that pandemic thing we had, remember when he was going to he was going to help American workers. And what ends up happening is the benefits went to you know, 
the very wealthy, 80%. And do you remember when he you know, he cut the taxes? Uh, said that, you know, we were going to cut taxes for working people, only to, you know, not. Remember that? Um, now, here's the thing. Oh, oh, infrastructure. Remember every week was infrastructure week? There were tons of photo ops. Tons of stuff. Him in cute little hats, driving little trucks. Did we get any infrastructure? No. And remember, Mexico was going to build that 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 big, beautiful wall, and they were going to pay for it? Or No, wait a minute. We were just going to get the Mexican workers to build it, but Mexico was still going to... No, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't even know at this point. But the one consistent thing that he did do, he made the wealthy wealthier. And over the weekend, one of the things that he did at, at their little fundraiser is promise the billionaire class, I'm going to keep your taxes low. You can count on me. I'm your guy. So return on investment. And again, if he did raise $50 million, working people, if he did, I think this is something my grandfather always said. And you've heard me say it a thousand times because it's so true. If a rich person is going to take a buck out of their pocket to tell you you don't need something, you better spend two to get it because they understand return on investment. So if our billionaire class did dig deep into their pockets to find $50 million to give Donald Trump, what kind of a return on investment do you think they're going to be looking for? How much do you think they want back? How much? How much? 100? 200 million? They're going to get it back. I want to hear your thoughts. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, Jared Cassidy from Smart Union is going to be here to talk about the big success uh, that they had in lobbying and winning uh, two-person crews on our trains back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So on Tuesday, April 2nd, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced new rule. A new rule requiring a minimum of two people on a train. Uh, Two people. Yes, two. Uh, This minimum crew requirement is for all railroads. That's going to be freight, passenger, commuter train, all of that. And and look, I think the secretary said it best himself. Uh, this is a good day for the safety of all rail workers, rail passengers, and every American who lives near uh, rail lines. Uh, they're safer today than they were yesterday. He went on to say that this is a rule that is good for workers, good for communities, and good for America's economy. Now, what I found interesting in going through all of this stuff, there were more than 13,000 comments on this rule and only 60 that were opposed. And I got to imagine there were more than 60 lobbyists uh, lobbying Congress to ha- not allow this to happen. But here to share some thoughts on what I'm, I'm seeing is, look, this is a victory. This has been more than a decade in the making. I've asked Jared Cassidy to come talk with us. Jared is the Assistant National Legislative Director for SMART, the Sheet Metal Air Rail Transport Union. Jared, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. Always good to be here. So let's start with the fact that this, I remember the first time I heard of this issue was back in 2013. So we're over a decade ago that this has been on the table. I know Bob Casey was fighting for it to get something done. This has been a long time in the making, and this administration got something done. 
Yeah, absolutely. This has been very long time in the making. In fact, I actually think it predates 2013, if I recall. But long story short, uh, railroads made known their desire to cut the crews from two to one and ultimately one to zero. The agreements that we had in place are, are starting to phase out, if you will, uh, based on the way that they're worded. And because the railroads were determined, regardless of safety, lacking data, whatever their justification was attempted to be, they didn't have to support their case. They were still hell bent on, on reducing the crews. And so we as, as rail labor have been pushing as hard as we can to get a backstop put in place. Uh, we started making progress under President Obama. Unfortunately, President Trump came into office and uh, his administrator pulled the rug out from everybody's feet, said, we're not going to do that. And then we kind of had to start from from a, a new, if you will, uh, under President Biden. And so thankfully, this administration, this FRA administrator and Amit Bose recognized the, the critical safety issue here and, and did something about it. And finally, as our president, Jeremy Ferguson, said uh, during the press release with Secretary Buttigieg, Tuesday was a monumental day. Now, one of the things that, that the secretary said that caught my attention, and I, I got I to gotta get some clarification from you. He said that, uh, you know, as a country, we shouldn't be accepting the current average of three derailments a day. Um, is it that high? I mean, look, you, the the East Palestines, that doesn't happen every day. But the fact that there are three derailments a day, that seems that seems high. Well, actually, it's higher. Uh, what you're seeing is there's only three reportable derailments a day. And I would even dare say what you're seeing is three serious derailments a day. The The amount of smaller derailments are much more frequent. I mean, we're we're in the dozens upon tens of dozens, most likely every single day in this in this country when it comes to railroad safety. And the railroads want you to believe that that's an acceptable margin. You know, they, they work our, our folks to the bone. I mean, fatigue is higher than it's ever been. Harassment, intimidation, and all these external factors that no one wants present in their, in their work environment with the exception of the railroad industry. You know, all these things are present and all these bad things are happening, but the railroads on the flip side are saying, hey, this is normal business. It's okay that these things are happening. And I've even seen them put in writing that they're akin to fender benders. We're talking about tank cars with hundreds of thousands of gallons of hazardous materials involved in fender benders and, and the railroad wants you to think that's okay. And it's not. Yeah, I, but look, to I, your point, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I've been near these. I've been around these, uh, these trains and these giant locomotives and these giant cars uh, that are carrying our trucks and these chemicals and all this stuff. There, there's no such thing as a fender bender. Uh, no. These, these things, no, there's no such thing. No, there's absolutely no such thing. In fact, you know, these are the types of uh, events that injure our folks are the types of events that result in bigger things. And, you know, most people have seen the, the safety triangle, if you will. I can't recall the pyramid name off the top of my head at the moment, but it's, it's present in most workplaces. And it talks about how all these minor accidents ultimately lead to one major accident. And, and that's true just, as, just the same as it is anywhere else. Yeah. It, it's also true in railroading. But the railroads want you to believe that all these minor things aren't a big deal. But the reality of it is, is they're huge, you know, and these are these are factors at play that cannot be ignored. And, and you need adequate staffing. You need rested people to combat these issues. And frankly, you need an environment that is healthy and, and fair to the men and women that actually make up the ranks. And, and that just it doesn't exist. No, you're right. And most of the people that I talk to. Um, they are. They're exhausted. They're worn out. They they want time off. That you know the money isn't even unimportant. As what as the one guy explained to me, he goes, I just I just need a break. Uh, so yep. you're you're not you're you're not saying anything that I haven't heard already. Uh, but this this idea of there being two people on a train, look, I look at the fact that there were over thirteen thousand comments, only sixty negative ones. Most people, I think, realize you've got these trains that are mile two, I don't know, three miles long. One person can't possibly. Uh, be able to keep track of all of that. I don't think two can. I got to be honest. I don't think two is even enough uh, as a minimum. I I think it should be more, but um, walk me through. I mean, how, how big are these trains? How does one, how do two people keep track of everything going on? Well, it's, it's almost a modern day miracle and for lack of a better way to say it, but you know, right now the current industry standard 
just two people in the cab of locomotive. You know, you asked about the train length. Train length right now is growing and it's growing exponentially. And the railroads have even publicly stated that it's going to get worse or longer. You know, right now we have trains in excess of three miles. We've even seen a few, a handful that are pushing four miles and, and they're staffed with two people. You know, length or the size of the train, the weight of the train has nothing to do with staffing in any capacity. You have two people on America's class one freight railroads in the cab of the locomotive, unless there's an extenuating circumstance like a trainee, which was true in East Palestine or something else. Typically speaking though, it's two people and it's a monumental task to take on that, that workload every single day. You know, when you're moving from point A to point B, it's not too bad. You need those two people to make sure that you're operating safely. You need one observing the, the territory in front of you. You need another monitoring the systems. But it's when something happens, when there's a mechanical breakdown, when there's an abnormal issue or, God forbid, an unfortunate event, that's when the two people are most critical. And that's when it affects the, the public the most. You know, these people depend on us to operate safely. And if, it, if it's something as simple as blocking a crossing, if all of a sudden I have a mechanical breakdown because of the length of my train, I'm forced to stop on this crossing. And, and the only way that gets fixed is by having a second person. That engineer can't do it by themselves. They need that conductor. And so to protect the public, to serve the public and to do our job, it takes two people. How many people used to be out of train? I remember when I was a kid, and again, this is going back into the 70s. Uh, I remember there was actually a caboose on the train. You saw the little red caboose, and uh, you knew that was the end. Uh, but I remember there being people stationed throughout the train, um, you know, even I think for just monitoring, or I, I don't even know why, but I remember there being more people. How many were, were on a normal train back in the 70s? So in the 70s, up till about 85, there were five. You had a locomotive engineer and a fireman um, who served, you know, to shovel the coal back in the tender and kind of help keep the locomotive going. Those were the two up front. And then, to your point, in the back or in the caboose, there were three. Uh, normally, you'd have your conductor, your brakeman, and, and possibly an assistant brakeman or switchman, depending on how the setup was. But right up until about the 1985 era, you did have five people on every train. And why did why why this move away? And especially and look, I get the fact that it's it's it comes down to profit over people. But how did they how did they get to move away from that? Sure, I'm gonna be a little unfairly critical of probably historically speaking of some of my predecessors in the union. But a lot of that was given up in collective bargaining. You know, the justification was technology, which is kind of what they're trying to make the argument there. Although it doesn't meet it doesn't meet the criteria that it did back in the day but it was technology. So in place of the EOT, if you watch a train go by, the very last car will have a box on the end of it with a flashing red light. That is the equivalent of your caboose now. And what that what that device is called is simple. It's an end of train device. Um, and, and it basically lets the locomotive engineer and the conductor know that the train is intact, that the air pressure and, and the air system is working and that the train is moving. And, and I mean, that in essence, is what did away with the caboose. You know, the, the folks that used to sit on the rear end were there to observe the train. They, they, they had the distinct privilege or obligation to watch the train as it traversed the tracks. And they were able to look at it and observe any issues or abnormalities that may be occurring, like a stuck brake or sparks or smoke or things of that nature. You know, now we can't do that. All we have is the EOT. But they were also able to tell the engineer, hey, we're looking good back here. Everything's working. Everything's fine. And now it's that little it's that little box that just sends up a radio communication. Now, the one thing I want to throw in here is that EOT, despite the fact that technology is 30 years old, fails more than any other piece of technology in the railroad industry. It's, it's more common for that device not to work than it is to work. And it's really a shame that we lost those workers throughout the collective bargaining process. And it really wasn't wasn't about safety. It was about, like you said, it's about profits. It's about all the things that have no place when you're trying to protect workers and you're trying to protect communities. There should never be this, but what will it do to the bottom line aspect? And unfortunately, that's what's got us here today. So uh, look, I, I'm gonna go to this. I mean, the two-person the two rule, this is a good thing, right? It, very much so. 
So, you know, this is going to make us a little bit safer. I think there's a lot more. And in fact, we've had conversations over the last several months of ways that should things that should be moved forward, uh, you know, uh, ending this precision scheduled railroading that you've talked about, uh, maybe having some regulations on how these trains are, are are loaded and all of those things. What what next? What is the next push to ensure our rails and our communities are safer? Well, the next big thing is getting this memorialized in legislation. We need a law to back it up and make it more substantial. You know, unfortunately, when you depend on regulations, the administrations have a little too much power to to do or undo what the last one did. Right. So, you know, we, we really need legislation here to lock in the safest course for everybody. And so that's that's priority number one. Priority number two, in my opinion, is getting after the growing length of trains because that is actually the next big threat to what's going on in the railroad industry. And as these trains get longer, the more derailments we're gonna start seeing happen. And it's it's something that, that we've got to get a hold of and we've got to get a hold of it quickly. And you brought up Senator Casey earlier, you know, Senator Brown, Senator Vance, Casey, Fetterman, they all brought about the Rail Safety Act in response to the East Palestine uh, derailment. And, you know, to their credit, they took on the two person crew issue. They took on a, a, the, the wayside detector issue, but they also to some degree took on the growing train length issue. And while it doesn't go far enough, it, it does start movement on, on addressing what is going to become the biggest threat in rail safety in the next 10 years. And, and so, you know, we are hopeful for that, but priority number two, or actually priority number one, because it includes two person is getting the rail safety act through. No, because my mind goes, okay, you're going to mandate that there be two people on a train. Uh, what's to stop the railroad from going, okay, we're just not going to have two trains anymore. We're going to make those two one, and boom, we've we've now saved money by you you bringing, you know, 10-mile trains down the tracks. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely a, an argument that's going to be made. And the unfortunate reality, Rick, is they were going to do that anyway, regardless of how many people are in the cab of the locomotive, because... You know, part of the precision scheduled railroading model is doing as much as you can with as little as possible so that you can get blood out of a turnip or in this case, make the most money uh, possible on each time around. But the reality of it is when you do stuff like that, the service just becomes deplorable. And on the second end of it, this unsafe condition or the unsafe aspect of it is exponentially increased off the charts, you know, these, these, this equipment is not made for the amount of forces that they have to endure when you grow the, the length of trains. And when you do that, what ends up happening is you end up have empty cars and you have loaded cars and it's a, it's more of a mixed bag. And those physics, you're a truck driver, those physics don't work out well and eventually it results in failure. And that's what we're going to see. And even the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration has acknowledged this. Uh, last year, they sent out a safety advisory talking about how trains are being built into the length that they're going. And the FRA basically said, you need to be real careful how you're constructing these trains because we are seeing an increase in derailments. Now, one of the things that can blow your mind, at least it did for me, is the FRA historically up until this point never actually collected the data on how a train was built when a derailment happened. You know, they knew the number of cars, but they didn't really take into account just how long the train was, nor did they take into account where the empties were, where the loads were. And so we're starting to see a long overdue shift in the FRA and how they approach their investigations towards these derailments. And we're going to keep pushing the FRA there because it's all about that data. The railroads like to say that there's no data to justify regulations or laws. And the reality of it is, is there's no data because they're preventing the data so that they can have the freedom to do whatever in God's country they want to do. And, and where we're at now is not a safe space. No, no, we don't collect the data so that we don't actually know what's going on. And, and the fact, you had told me this a while ago, that you've got these really heavy cars at the end, uh, empties in the middle, and you go, that's a recipe for a disaster. As you're trying to stop, you're not going to have the inertia from those heavier trains or are going to run over uh, the, the empty ones at, at some point. Uh, and it's not good. So let me ask you, uh, did East Palestine... Is that the driving force behind this this two person crew? Do you think? And if no. it is, in your opinion, the driving force, what is it going to take to be the driving force to get these other things that that need to be done? 
Yeah, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off there. Absolutely, that's the driving force. You know, my heart breaks for the people of East Palestine, and I have sat in that community, and I have talked to a number of those folks through the NTSB process, and, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what's happened to them. You know, and the reality of this is when you put a mushroom cloud into the sky of your own doing, it creates a pressure that you you as the railroad didn't want, you know, and that absolutely is the fact that or is, is the thing that's driving all of this momentum right now to healthy change. What do we need to keep that going? I run that through my head all the time and it scares me to death because already we've seen what happened to East Palestine and you look at the turmoil and the friction and, and, and the absolute obstructionist behavior by the railroads in Congress. I mean, they're doing everything in their power to prevent more rules and regulations or more rules and laws to tell them how to do their work safely. And so what's it going to take? I don't know. I mean, hopefully common sense. You brought up the comments for the two-person crew rulemaking twice now and talking about how there was 13 plus thousand people that wrote in support and you had only 60 that were negative. You know, you talk about pressure and, and public speaking up and, and all of those things are happening and yet it's still not enough. And so what's it going to take? I mean, it keeps me up at night thinking about that. But you talk to any railroader out there now, regardless of craft, and they will tell you the next big one is imminent. Not enough change has taken place. We are still in a very bad space. And the next one, if nothing else happens, is imminent. And if it can be much worse it can be much worse than what happened in East Palestine. And, and that's the stuff that scares me. And that's exactly what keeps, uh, unfortunately, the railroads from, from having the hand forced on. Sadly, not, one of those situations is not a matter of if, just when. And this is why we, we contact our representatives. We, we make comments, uh, but we also vote for people who are going to gonna listen. Uh, Jared, as always, I appreciate you taking time for us. I hope I hope we don't talk again on this uh, uh, other than on a very positive, the next win. Uh, but congratulations on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jared Cassidy, Assistant National Legislative Director there at SMART, the Sheet Metal Air Rail Transport Union, smart-union.org, the website. If you want to take a look at their work, uh, I want to hear your thoughts. What do you think? Uh, should we be? I'm personally a fan of breaking up these uh, these monopolistic rails and going back to the old days where we had more railroad companies doing this stuff. But I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. Thanks for tuning in to The Rick Smith Show. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. Like us on Facebook instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel you can find all that and much more at the ricksmithshow.com welcome back to the rick smith show now here is rick smith so the big story on friday lauren bobert evidently uh you know instead of gun fetish barbie drunken barbie and look i don't care about her antics could care less i'm i'm i would be thrilled uh, if she were out of Congress, doing her antics somewhere else. And I'm hoping that happens. I'm hoping in the biggest way. But here's the thing. Uh, you got Ken Buck, a Republican, who resigned from Congress on March 26th, basically saying the Republican Party's lost their minds. Uh, they're crazy. They basically ostracized him because he wasn't crazy enough. And he's got better things to do with his life. And while never been a Ken Buck fan, got to respect his position to go, I'm leaving. Uh, and California, Colorado governor uh, there there announced that there would be a special election. That's going to be June 25th. And um, I've got one of the candidates I'm hoping. I'm hoping folks in Colorado in the 4th Congressional District get out and vote for. That's why I've asked Trisha Calvaris to come talk with us. She's the Democratic nominee in this special Colorado 4th Congressional District election. Trisha, thanks for taking time for us. Oh, brother, thank you so much for having me on. What up, Labor fam? Oh, it feels so good to be with y'all. I appreciate you being here because look, this is this is one of the this is the race everyone's gonna be looking at because look, I think Ken Buck was right. I think the Republicans have lost their mind. I think the the House uh, Lunatic Caucus is is holding the country hostage. And I'm hoping people in your district realize just how far off the rails the Republican Party has gone. 
and we'll listen to some reason, hopefully, hopefully from someone like you. That's right. And I got to say, talking unions, talking the power of the labor movement, it's resonating. I'm, I'm hearing from folks who are unaffiliated and even some common sense Republicans that that's what we need. That's right. So let me ask you the dumb question, and as I ask it to everybody, why are you putting yourself in the middle of this? I mean, uh, you know, anything that that you know, gun fetish Barbie is going to be part of. It's going to be a clown show. Um, what brought you to this? What made you go, hey, you know, right now I'm going to jump in the middle of this? Yeah. So I'm I'm from the district. I grew up here. You know, born and raised. Went to public schools here, and then I went east on a full academic ride. I was former director of speech writing at the AFL CIO. I was a federal, a member of the federal civil service. And then my mom got sick. This was last fall. And I knew my union, AFGE, would have my back. So I was able to drop everything, come home, and provide end of life care for her. Now, she was also taking care of my dad, who's also a member of the federal civil service. And thanks to his benefit, he lived four years beyond his, his diagnosis of a kidney cancer. And so after we took care of my mom, we were, my husband, who also in a union, thank you very much, was in his job's remote, was able to move home with me back home to Colorado and provide end of life care for him too. Yep. Thank God I had my union. No, and you know, the thing is, is thank I Thank God, and I'm running, I am running, I am running so that everybody else can have a union too. So that everybody else in my situation as a millennial, as the sandwich generation can have the support and the structures they need to take care of their family. It's that simple. If without a union, I just like that was keeping me up as night at night as it was. And then Lauren Boebert ditched her district and decided to run in my backyard. And there was no way I was going to let that go unchallenged. So that's why I'm stepping up to take her on. And we actually have a shot because you know what? People do not want a placeholder. And that's what George Lopez is. People want an actual public servant who's going to step up for them. No, and the hope is, is come just June 25th, the folks of the 4th District will come out and give give you a shot. And then in November, keep keep crazy away. And I think that's the argument. Uh, you know, look, working people aren't getting what they need. I hear this all the time. I hear this from rural voters. I hear this from urban voters. I hear this from everyone. We're not getting what we need. Inflation's hurting us. Our wages aren't keeping up. Our health care isn't, isn't what it should be. And yet what we get out of Congress, sadly, people like Boebert, you know, basically turning it into their own reality TV show instead of actually doing the work of the people. And that's why I think, you know, someone like you, Tricia, should be given a shot to get in there. Someone who knows what it's like to struggle, someone who knows what it's like to have to take care of a family member. This is this is who we should be wanting in Congress. Yes, sir. I mean, and especially with the way like you look at Lauren Boebert plays with other people's livelihoods by not wanting to fund the government, by not wanting to pass these bipartisan investments that literally can create pathways into the middle class and good union jobs in places that have been overlooked and left behind, like in rural Colorado, like in our post-industrial communities out here. So you're absolutely right. It's I am a dogged hard worker and I'm working hard for working people. And that's just something that Lauren Boebert's not doing and it's very clear. You know, one of the frames that I keep hearing is that, you know, this election more than any in, in my lifetime, and I'm a little bit older than you, uh, this is about democracy. This is about the difference between democracy and authoritarianism. And you as a federal, former federal worker, as a federal worker, um, I'm sure you're keenly aware of Trump's Schedule F plan to go in and fire all of the federal workers and, and make patronage great again. Is this an issue that resonates with some of the people that you're talking about? Do they understand that democracy truly could be uh, under assault and, and what we've taken for granted for so long uh, could go away? I think people are starting to get it, that if, if we don't get this election right, it could sincerely be our last. So we all have to step up. And people do also understand, like, hey, who's who's supporting our military? Who's writing our Social Security checks? It's federal government employees. And you know what? As I'm running, I am pushing back against that stereotype that the federal worker isn't a hard worker. We work incredibly hard. We're undersourced. We're underpaid. And you know what? Having to pivot constantly in the chaos that people like Lauren Boebert create in Congress by not doing their job to fund the government and instead are doing these sham impeachments. Do your job, Lauren. And she's not doing her job. So let's fire her and put in a hardworking union person who will. But here's the thing, and this is where I keep coming back to this this idea that um, 
you know, I hear this from my, my red hat friends all the time. Well, we could get rid of the government and nobody would notice. That's not true. Uh, the people who who are essential, the people who who do the things that we need, are tired of being treated like a political football, and this is what Republicans have done for 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 decades now. Uh, every time we're on the edge of shutting things down and causing crisis, it's all on the backs of the federal employees. Yes, and that affects working people, right? Like our ranchers, our farmers. If they're not getting their crop insurance. That's their bottom line. That's hurting their bottom line. So she like by not funding the government, you're hurting employees of the government and the livelihoods that their critical services support. Well, let me ask you about that, because you you brought up the ranchers and farmers and in your district, there are a number of those. And look, I live in a rural community myself where, you know, farming is 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 prevalent. Uh, and thank our farmers. Thank goodness for them feeding the country, doing the hard work that we need them to do. Um, how do we reach out to them in a way that uh, that they, they get that the government is not there to harm them as they've been told repeatedly by the right wing outrage machine, but that there, there's a partnership and and a want for them to succeed? They get it, especially in the eastern part of our district where there's drought issues constantly. Right. So how are you constantly growing these crops that take a lot of water? Let me tell you how supplementing it with solar panels with windmills and especially as we start to reshore those manufacturing pieces right here we should be making them here we should be making them on the eastern plains and they should go on and supplement i actually i met a farmer true story rick he's getting rid of water and irrigation on his land and he's putting up solar panels instead for his sheep they're going to just graze underneath it that's going to be the income and we want to make sure those solar panels are american made so they get it like they're excited about it i think We've heard so much division for so long. People want to hear a vision. They want to hear of what's possible. It's great to hear that, that the farmers go in that direction. Because, you know, my, my local school district did that about 10 years ago. Uh, they put up solar panels, and one of the guys one of the, uh, the guys who works at the school has sheep. He brings the sheep in to go eat all the grass underneath uh, underneath the solar panels. It's, it's a great thing. Uh, and it's something that we should be the, be doing more and being the leader of the new generation of energy production and clean green energy and homegrown clean energy. And and look, I, I look at the Republicans and, and I hate to beat them up, but it's so easy because they don't have an agenda. They don't have policies. All they've got is outrage and division. Uh, are you finding that people when you're out there, you know, shaking hands, kissing babies, doing all that? Uh, that people are, are, are tired of the, the division and are looking for something to draw us together? Yes. And in fact, I was on con I was on conservative radio just yesterday talking about this, To especially because, listen, we're in the AI era. There's going to be so many advances coming down the pike. Who Who's going to lead that? Who's going to build it? Is it going to be America with our values of high labor standards? Or is it going to be our adversaries with lower labor standards, which is what we've had in green manufacturing for a very long time. But thanks to Biden Harris, right? Now we're reshoring it, we're making it here. Let's make more of it. People are hungry for that. And Rick, let me tell you, they also want pathways to those excellent jobs that don't necessarily require a college degree. And who's the expert at it? It's our unions. People want actual solutions and actual vision. They're hungry for it. And this guy I talked to yesterday on conservative radio said, come back. We need more of these actual engagements and solutions. Let's have more discussions like this. So I'm going everywhere. Heck yeah. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, too, too much of what our politic has become is we focus on only the problem and the problem is the issue. Uh, we never talk about the solutions. You know, I look at, you know, the things that that keep, you know, being thrown at us to divide us uh, always seems to block any progress for working people. So the anger out there and, and I'm, I'm curious if while you're out talking to people in Colorado's fourth congressional district, if they get a sense that they're not being heard in Washington, that someone like them isn't in the halls of Congress carrying their water. Did, did you get a sense of that? Absolutely. Abs and you talk to young folks, you think they're represented in Congress right now? Absolutely not. Where they're so worried about issues like housing and they get they get unions. That's the other thing. Like they get unions. 
Well, unions are, are basically democracy, democracy in the workplace, getting a fair share of the, the wealth of what your labor creates. And I think when you put it to, in that way to people, everyone agrees with it. I've, I've, I've found very few working people are like, no, I don't agree with that statement, which is why I think we do need to be pounding it more and more. So let me ask you, I ask this to everybody, what's that issue uh, that, that, that Trisha goes, this is, this is the one that I, this is the hill I die on protecting workers from AI, like I like bargaining rights, pro act, we need the pro act. Okay, I'm I'm running out, let's finish the job. Let's let's make it easier to form and join unions because of AI, right? Because of and and let's look at policies, how can we return value to working people like that tech. So when I'm on the on the calls, right, on the more affluent parts of the district, where folks work in IT, they work in these white collar jobs, I'm making calls and they're saying, you know what, I would donate. I just lost my job, though. And I say, oh, did AI have anything to do with it? And every single time they say, it sure did. Yeah. And I'm saying, have you thought of a union? And once I kind of, you know, walk them through that, I now have a bunch of folks who are in these like high tech jobs calling me being like, say more about this. What law do we need to change? So this is also an opportunity to educate these kind of unaffiliated voters about the power of a union, especially in emerging technology. So one of the things I've been saying, Teresa, is that uh, unions are what can bring this country back together. Uh, it was the glue that held my grandparents' generation together uh, as they fought for better wages, hours, conditions. And it can be, again, as we look, as we organize workplaces, we bring people together on like-minded issues. And it's hard to divide people when they're, when they're united on like-minded issues. And then maybe we stop caring about all the fringe issues that don't really affect our lives and spend more time on what really does. Health care for our families, opportunities for our children, safe neighborhoods, all the things I'm sure, sure you hear all about. Every, yes, which are core values of our labor movement, of like the community that we build, of the solidarity, of lifting each other up. Yes. And that's as more and more people I'm talking to learn about it. It's, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I think that's also the labor movement. We need to almost think of it as like, we're almost in this like beyond a bipolar democracy. This is the argument Ann Applebaum makes, where it's not your traditional Republican Democrat. The sooner we can get that out of our mind, the better. It's exactly what you're talking about, that solidarity across parties, across different lines. We're all in the same neighborhoods, though, right, to making sure that we're lifting each other up and putting humanity back into it. My mom was MAGA. My dad was a Republican. And I'm I'm pro-union. So we're and we're all human and we are all human. Yeah, but here's the thing. And, you know, one of the issues that I keep talking about, especially with my red hat friends, is the idea of economic security, something our grand my grandparents generation uh, fought for and and passed on. Uh, I worry that we're not going to be able to pass that on to my children because, as you've pointed out, AI is coming, uh, robotics, automation, all of this stuff is coming, and the distribution of wealth in this country is going to overwhelmingly go to the handful at the top. So having some kind of equitable way to make sure that families can sustain and and not just not just exist but actually thrive in the new economy, I think is vital to have people in there who are champions for working people. Yes, yes, and that's what the Chips and Science Act was a fabulous start. Bipartisan Chips and Science Act was a fabulous start. Without Lauren Boebert. <laughs> With exact yes, she voted against it. Good start. But like chips are only one part of it. It's the science part. Let's create those amazing pathways into jobs of the future. Because you better believe our adversaries have plans to do it, right? Like the CCP, there's actually a plan to leapfrog us in key industries. And it's not just the CCP, it's you know, there's Germany, Singapore. We what happened to America competitiveness? We're the best in the world. We've always been the best. And I think that there's a hunger to do that again. So I, I think that message is resonating, Rick. I think you're onto something. Uh, Trisha Calvary, uh, give me give me the 30 second elevator pitch. Why you? Because I am from here. I have returned to take care of my parents at the end of life, and I am running to take care of people who've been overlooked and left behind for too long on a message of solidarity, of investing in our future and of an actual vision that we can all move forward together. Good stuff, Trisha. Trisha Calvaries, I appreciate you taking time for us. Hope folks will check out your website, trishaforcolorado.com. We'll get links out on social media. And I'm hoping that you know people can, can come to this June 25th. If you're in Colorado's 4th Congressional District, make sure you are, are, are voting. And uh, 
I, send I, swag. Send me your swag. I want union swag, guys. Send it my way. Go to my website. Let me know. And I'll wear it. I'll wear it everywhere. Send, Beautiful. Send Trisha, appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Thank you. You brought. Uh, good stuff, Trisha Calvary. So I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, is this going to be an interesting election? Are we are we looking forward to this? I know I am. Because uh, one, I want to see them flip that district. Uh, but two, I, I want to see Lauren Boebert doing something else. Maybe let her get her gig at Fox News or, or Newsmax or one of those other places. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1952. That was the day that President Harry S. Truman issued Executive Order 10340, nationalizing the U.S. steel industry. The president had hoped to stop a looming steel strike while the nation was embroiled in the Korean War. The president's order listed several reasons for the action, including, quote, American fighting men and the fighting men of other nations of the United Nations are now engaged in deadly combat with the forces of aggression in Korea, and forces of the United States are stationed elsewhere overseas for the purpose of participating in the defense of the Atlantic community against aggression. Another stated reason was that, quote, the weapons and other materials needed by our armed forces and by those joined with us in the defense of the free world are produced to a great extent extent in this country. And steel is an indispensable component of substantially all of such weapons and materials. He also listed, quote, steel is likewise indispensable to the carrying out of programs of the Atomic Energy Commission of vital importance to our defense efforts. Another reason Truman claimed was that continuing an uninterrupted supply of steel is also indispensable to the maintenance of the economy of the United States, upon which our military strength depends. After the announcement of the order, it only took some steel company owners 27 minutes to file for an emergency injunction to stop the seizure. They were not successful in getting their injunction, but the case went on to the Supreme Court. In May, the court ruled in a 6-3 decision that President Truman did not have the right to seize the mills. The day the court decision came down, the steel workers went out on strike, eventually winning pay raises. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So last Friday, a 4.8 earthquake. Uh, that thing on the Richter scale. Uh, right heart, Bedminster golf course in new jersey uh trump world uh trump world hit by an earthquake lots of jokes lots of jokes i'm not gonna make one uh, about you know they said like something like 42 million people felt the quake uh here in pennsylvania did not uh but it you know, 4.8 uh, earthquake is kind of a deal uh now that that got marjorie train wreck green to uh then, then comment on it uh saying that god is sending america strong signs to tell us to repent uh, earthquakes and, and eclipses and many more things to come. I pray that our country listens. Oh, yeah, I do, too. Uh, we got to get some of these crazy people out of Congress. Uh, I pray that, uh, that that Lauren Boebert is showing the door. I pray that uh, Marjorie Three Names is showing the door. Most of the kook caucus, my congressman, for instance, I would like nothing more than to see Scott Perry on the unemployment line. Uh, and that's why November is so important. Make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you have a plan to vote. And make sure you vote. Make sure you vote. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, last week we talked about California raising its minimum wage uh, for fast food workers. I said that's a good thing. Um, and then came the right-wing spin machine, uh, the corporate spin machine, and I have been inundated with people going, see, they're going to lose jobs. Raising the minimum wage costs jobs. And they all sent me the same story. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting uh, how many people caught on. Because the headline, the headline was, you know, was pretty, pretty catching. Uh, that this woman, uh, she just, you know, she was shocked by the job loss. 
Uh, she, she'd she be happy to work at the old wage. She just wants a job. Uh, and that the, the, these evil people who insisted that they raise the minimum wage to 20 bucks for fast food workers, um, that, that they cost this poor woman her job. Uh, now, when you read the article, and everyone sent the Fox article. <laughs> Interesting. But when you read it, it, which and look, you know, a lot of it's accurate, and that she goes, you know, it would have been nice to have notice, so you know maybe we could get some some applications out, uh, you know maybe you know do some things, uh, you know to help, you know something, and and I got to tell you, you know it's one of those things where you know, there should have been some warning. Now what I do find interesting is when you read to the the, the bottom of the article, because they understand you know people read the headline and like the first paragraph. When you get down to to the the story, <laughs> um, you get to the woman that they quoted saying that, you know, I'm not quite so sure it was the, uh, the minimum wage. Uh, she said that, you know, that was part of it, but she seems to think that they were exempt from having to raise the minimum wage because here's the thing. Um, the law is if if you have sixty restaurants in the country, um, you have to pay this minimum wage. And if, if you don't, well, then then you're exempt from it. You pay the state's minimum wage, uh, which is like I think like four bucks less. Now, even if the article is not accurate, and that the minimum wage actually is the is the the reason, and that this wasn't just you know a good excuse. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not opposed to it because I got a bunch of this. Well, you want people to lose their jobs? No, I think people will find new fast food jobs. They they will pop up. Uh, but one of the things that I would really like to see, and I think we need to be moving towards as a society, is stop with this homogenization. Uh, I don't think we should have a, mil- a McDonald's on every block, uh, especially if you can't pay someone a living wage. Uh, now, we can have the conversation of how do we get people living wages. There's a lot of policy things that we can and should be doing. But this idea that, <laughs> this is the part that gets me, that workers should should take it on the chin so that these companies can, can have a business model set up on exploiting cheap labor, I think that has to stop. I think we as a society have to start saying, you know, maybe it's not all about the profit. Maybe it's not all about the shareholders. Maybe it really is about having an economy where working people benefit from their labor. And I don't know how you how you live on on seven twenty five or or fifteen bucks an hour as it is in uh, in, in California. Uh, I don't know how you do that. But if we're going to expect people to work 40 hours a week and 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 work hard and play by the rules they should be able to get ahead now this is where i got into a long conversation uh with with a friend recently over uh the statement of you know the young people don't want to work and and i happen to remind them that you know when we were young we didn't want to work either uh, i'll tell you I didn't want to freeze my behind off on a, on a shipping dock, uh, throwing boxes and, and doing heavy manual labor. I didn't. You know why I did it? Incentive. Uh, the wages that I earned back then were much higher than they are today. Uh, the reward for work was there. And I say this for every president of my lifetime. I want this president to be the guy who returns reward to work. I want that incentive for people to go and and work hard, play by the rules, but actually get ahead. And this fast food minimum wage is is a start in that direction. And if there's going to be some frictional changes, then then so be it. We're going to have to deal with that. And we're going to have to help those people with decent unemployment and with job training and opportunities to go in other directions. And you know what? Entrepreneurs who are going to fill that space by breaking up these big behemoths, by breaking up the the fast food monopoly, we give these these restaurant workers an opportunity to put out their own signal. And you know what? Maybe we start giving them some loans because there's some buildings available right now with some equipment in it that maybe we can help them get into and create jobs and some local flavor. You know, when I was a kid, you could go to communities across this country and everyone had something a little bit different. 
Whether it's a hot dog joint in Allentown, Pennsylvania, or a pizza joint in Chicago, or you know the or that the, the incredible sausage in in Erie, uh, you know the, the 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 great pizza that, I, that we had in Cleveland. Whether it's any of that stuff, that local flavor is important. It's been crushed. There's an Applebee's or a, a Texas Roadhouse or a McDonald's or a Wendy's or you name it in every community. And what they did is they crushed something else out. So for me, I got to tell you, I would kind of like to see a return to the good to the good old days, a return to, you know what, maybe there being some entrepreneurial spirit, maybe giving some folks the chance to put out their shingle. Uh, now, again, I come back to this story for all the people who sent throwing this story up at me. I don't buy that it was the minimum wage increase, but we're going to keep hearing these stories because they have to beat it up. Because if it works, oh, oh, imagine what other workers are going to want. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. If you miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. If you want to watch the video, freespeech.org is where you go see the TV show as well. I appreciate you being here. As always, thanks for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.